This is Be a Good Boss, How to Support Your Marginalized Colleagues. I know there's a ton of great sessions going on right now, so thank you so much for coming to this one. A little bit about me, I am Tara. I work for Pantheon. Pantheon is a web ops platform for WordPress and Drupal developers. We provide tools, we provide hostings, hosting. Um, I really love working for Pantheon and we're actually hiring right now. So I'd love to hear from you if you have some WordPress or Drupal experience. Um, at Pantheon, I'm on our developer relations team, which means I get to go out into the community and hear our community struggles, bring it back to the platform, make our product better. Uh, and part of that work is also being involved in diversity and inclusion initiatives in the Drupal and WordPress communities. You can find me everywhere on the internet, pretty much everywhere as Sparkling Robots. So, you know, reach out, say hi. Um, I'm also part of how my talk came to be today is because I am currently the leader of Drupal diversity and inclusion. We actually have a, a former leader of Drupal diversity and inclusion in the audience today as well. So we are well represented as a group. And this uh, working group is an all volunteer, totally grassroots effort to make the Drupal community safer and more inclusive. Uh, and it has given me the opportunity to hear from so many underrepresented people about their struggles at work. And that's where this talk really comes from. I am not an HR professional, so don't come to me for legal advice. Um, this is more about just the human to human approach about how to be more inclusive at work. So let's get started. I am coming to you today from Albuquerque, New Mexico in the United States. Uh, and I love board gaming, so a little personal stuff. Before I get into the meat of the presentation today, I wanna make a few sort of high level notes. First of all, uh, this topic can be really uncomfortable, especially for people of privilege, which I am definitely one of those. Uh, if you are a person with both power at work and privilege, sometimes it can feel uh, like really scary. It can make people feel really defensive. Um, and so I decided to make the whole presentation only using cute animal pictures. Not because it's not an important topic, it's a very important topic, but as a way of helping you kind of remember, take a deep breath if you start to feel stressed. This is uh, not a personal attack on anyone, it's just all of us working to do better. So that's why there's two demo pictures everywhere. I also wanna talk a little bit about my perspective. So I am a white, queer, non-binary woman working in tech. Um, in some ways, I obviously do not fit the dominant parad paradigm of straight white male. But in other ways, I do. I am a white person. I don't have a, a college degree in tech, but I do have a lot of nerdy interests. I've been around programmers all my life. So I have both privilege and I'm also underrepresented in this community. So I'm trying to kind of work as a bridge between the underrepresented people who don't have very much power in tech and help uh, the people who do have more power in tech understand where we're coming from and how to do better. Obviously, I have blind spots. Obviously, I'm going to be missing things. Um, so, you know, this is really just to give you some context about who I am. And if you think I've missed something, please, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Please let me know and we'd be happy to jump in and, and clarify or expand my knowledge on that. And it looks like, I'll go back. Um, so another thing I wanted to bring up is the, both the pandemic situation and the George Floyd related um, protests and riots and policy change and everything that's happening right now. Um, these both affect everyone around the world. There have been protests everywhere, obviously coronavirus is everywhere, but they have a disproportionate impact on people of color, women, uh, poor people, the people who tend to be underrepresented in tech as well. So uh, I bring it up both so that you can kind of uh, have that context of what's going on in this moment. It didn't feel fair to bring this topic up, but also because it's going to be in, in the discussions at work. You know, plenty of companies are writing emails and statements saying, oh, we're gonna start listening to our black employees. I think that's actually harder to do than it sounds. I think that this presentation will give you some tips for how to actually listen. Uh, and again, not get that sort of defensive reaction up. Um, and I also mentioned these particular things because uh, it's just, these, these challenges are really more than just checking a box at work. It's more than just being able to say, oh, I have an inclusive company. I checked some boxes off, everything's good. Uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, these things have material impact on people's lives, very, very serious impact. So let's keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation, which is much more um, uh, work focused, that this is well beyond work. 
All right, so the first half of the presentation is what is it like to be underrepresented at work? This is a women in tech conference. So I think that this half of the presentation is probably gonna feel pretty familiar. Um, so we're gonna talk that, and then at the second half is gonna be strategies for doing better by your employees. All right, yeah, you feel like an outsider is absolutely one of them. And then I'm gonna have to actually do something. So the first one is you don't fit in. Murray here says you feel like an outsider. This seems so obvious because obviously if you're underrepresented, you don't fit in, but there's a number of knock-on effects that happen because of this. Uh, you don't get the information and support you need to do your job properly. Uh, you're often assumed not to be competent. There are hiring studies that show if say two men and one woman are up for the final uh, hiring of a position, the woman will be almost vanishingly unlikely to get the job. And it's not exactly because she's a woman, but because we see patterns and we see, oh, this person fits into a group, this person doesn't, it actually affects our assumptions of competence. And last, you do a lot more emotional labor. Emotional labor in this case means performing emotions that you don't actually feel. Super, super common in customer facing jobs, but also common for minorities at work. Um, it's sort of insidious, wearying work of having to pretend you're not as bothered by issues in the workplace as you really are. Um, this is not just people's you know, feeling hurt, it's actually a known factor in burnout. So it's when you don't fit in at work, it can be a huge deal. And especially in tech where there's such an obsession with uh, culture fit, I think this can be a real liability. Yeah, I think Sarah, I feel like y'all are just gonna, uh, you already know everything I'm gonna say, so I'll, I'll get through these quickly. Um, you experience microaggressions. So if you're not familiar with the term microaggression, uh, this is a term coined by a professor at Columbia University named Daryl Sue. It is the everyday slights, indignities, put downs, and insults that people of color, women, LGBT populations, and those in marginalized uh, groups experience in their day-to-day -day interactions with people. So this isn't, you know, one horrible incident. This is sort of death by a thousand paper cuts. And again, this isn't someone just being sensitive. There are proven impacts on mental health. Microaggressions lead to anger, depression, lower work productivity, and lower problem-solving abilities. If you're not familiar with microaggressions, it's, uh, for example, I am a back-end developer, and when I go to tech conferences, it is not uncommon for someone to, someone to say to me, oh, you must be in marketing um, because I'm a woman, and they assume. So, you know, that's a kind of example of a microaggression. At companies and teams where women are the only, meaning they're the only woman on the team, 80% of them report experiencing microaggressions. I have the entire study about onlys, which is the when you're the only one, whether that's a woman or a person of color, in my slides, which I'll be linking to at the end. So you can dig into anything basically that I'm saying. There are a ton of articles and um, studies and all kinds of things about this. So you bear the burden of representation. This is exactly like Sarah Judd is talking about. You have to feel like you have to represent everyone like you. Again, I have an article about the loneliness of the female Cody, techie, sorry. And um, it's really about how in a, in a monoculture where everyone is the same, whether that's all male or all white, you're often the only person like yourself that they've ever had to work with, gotten the to work with, as I might say. Uh, and that can just make adds so much to the job. It adds burnout, it adds emotional labor. It means you always have to be working twice as hard with a smile on your face. Um, and it really adds a lot of uh, stress to the day. You make less money. So this is a global conference. Obviously every country has slightly different laws around this, but even in countries where there are equal pay laws, uh, in general, it is still true that white women will make less money than white men. Black women will make less money than white women all for the same pay, all with the same experience. And it's hard to come to work knowing that every day. You don't know if you'll have backup. This is something I hear constantly, something bad happens at work and a woman or person of color on the team does not want to report it to their boss, does not want to report it to HR. And that's because you don't actually know if it'll go well for you. And anecdotally, uh, mostly what I hear is that it doesn't, right? It either comes, either nothing changes or it actually comes back on the reporter. Uh, this is true across whistleblowers, all kinds of groups. Um, so, you know, it's hard to know if you'll have backup. There's not a lot of trust and you're very socially isolated. And all of these, of course, add up to you think about leaving. Almost everything I just said is going to lead to more emotional labor, which is going to lead to burnout, which is going to lead to wanting to leave. Uh, this may be leaving your job or it may be actually leaving the tech industry. 
In tech, we talk a lot about the pipeline. There's not enough women and people of color in the pipeline to hire. Uh, I, A of all, don't agree with that, but B, we also need to be looking at the, the full length of someone's career. Plenty of people are in tech already who are women, who are people of color, who are uh, queer people, and we're leaving. We're leaving maybe faster even than we're getting into the industry. So this is a huge thing. Uh, if you're managing, obviously, you don't want to be losing um, people. It costs a lot for to have turnover. So this is sort of, this half of the presentation is I, the experience of the person who's underrepresented. And now we're going to talk about what can you do? The person I kind of addressing this to is someone who is a uh, team lead, who is a direct manager of people. Maybe you work in an open source project uh, and you're a maintainer and you have some leadership there. So these are some strategies you can use to help your team uh, support your diverse teammates. And when I say we, I've been using underrepresented a lot, or we, this is not a monolithic group. So please, before you take all of my advice to heart, I, I've done my very best to give good advice. Also consult the actual individuals on your team. Make sure that this is helping them. Uh, and you're not just like Tara said to do this in that presentation I saw. Make sure you're actually treating the individuals how they want to be treated. First of all, I invite you to reflect. So start paying attention to your own frame of reference. Consider how your own personal tastes and your background affect the way you show up at work. So this is your education, your race, your gender, your religion, your physical or mental health. Maybe you feel really comfortable bringing those to work. Maybe you don't. But it's really important to notice how they do or do not appear for you at work and how they do or do not appear for your reports. Um, people will follow your lead. So if you're never talking about your family, if you're never talking about personal issues, they will also kind of button up and not share that information. And this is also why I opened the presentation with a little bit about my background and how I fit into the greater context. So take some time to reflect and really see where you do have some privilege and some power and where maybe you don't. I think all of us have a little bit of both. Next, I invite you to slow down. Speed and spontaneity are never inclusive. And we work in an industry where people idolize companies that say move fast and break things, right? Move fast and break things might work with code, you know, but with people, it's really, really, really reckless. So, you know, I think a lot of companies are flying by the seat of their pants. It's very agile, very go, go, go. And so one example I like to think of is a happy hour, right? You've got your team together. You're going to celebrate a big product launch or a big, you know, customer release or anything. And you want to have a happy hour. Well, it's actually not a simple problem to find a happy hour location that's going to be equally fun for everyone on the team. Uh, maybe the venue is not accessible, right? So someone actually might have trouble getting physically to the venue. Uh, maybe they don't have food for everyone. I think it's nothing is more depressing than a party where 99% of people are enjoying dinner and 1% of people is, are just having like a glass of water. I think that's very sad. Um, do you have non-alcoholic options? Is the lighting bright enough so that everyone can see and, and fully participate? Is it so loud that everyone can hear or if there are people struggling? And, you know, is everyone going to feel safe getting home from the venue afterwards? Right. These are all questions that you can find the answer to. But often it takes a little bit more time than just what's the, my favorite bar? OK, we're going to go there. So make sure you're planning ahead. Know what your specific team members actually need so that you can accommodate them. Nothing feels as good as knowing that your boss thought about you when they were planning a big celebration. And I want to be very clear, I am pro parties. I think parties are a fantastic way to build team cohesion and, and uh, make it feel more comfortable for people. I just want to be at a party where everyone is having a good time. Make space. This one can be kind of difficult uh, to do People can feel kind of uncomfortable, especially like, right, so right now there's all these protests happening, right? It is so difficult to come to work and to see everyone acting like nothing has happened when something is going on in the world, like these George Floyd protests. Uh, you don't know if your boss doesn't know about the protests or if they don't care. So start paying attention to current events, start seeing how they might impact your uh, reports. And, you know, ask yourself, does someone on your team maybe need a little bit more space, support, and empathy right now? Um, during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, which uh, were a very upsetting time for me personally and for a lot of women I know, there was a lot of talk of sexual assault, um, just kind of constantly in the news. Uh, I had a boss, you know, reach out and say to me just privately, hey, I know the Brett Kavanaugh hearings are 
really intense and like no no worries if you're not at full capacity. It was such a graceful gift to receive. And I invite you to consider how you can give that gift to your teammates as well. Uh, all right, so ask. I think sometimes people get a little nervous about asking people for how they'd like to be supported, how they'd like to be addressed, but you don't have to read anybody's mind. As a boss, I know I feel constantly like I need to be on top of everything. I need to know what's going on and be in control. And that's just not possible. And especially with your reports, especially if they're different from you, you can't, you can't know what they need. So make sure you're asking regularly how they're doing. Make sure you're building time into every one-on-one -on -one that allows them to talk about anything they want. It's not just all work all the time. Uh, I have a great article in the resources at the end of the slides about the art of the awkward one-on-one, -on -one, which is all about how to commit publicly or rather not publicly, but directly to your report and say, I'm going to be a little bit awkward. You're going to be a little bit awkward. And together we'll build that trust in a way that both parties feel comfortable so that it's not like uh, my boss just started saying awkward things at meetings and I'm very uncomfortable. It's, it's a great article. Um, and lastly, make sure that you leave some space uh, for them to bring things up that you can't predict. So ask them if there's anything else they want you to know. Just at the end of every meeting, make it a habit, leave 10 minutes. Is there anything else I need to know? That way, something that is perhaps not work-related but is on their minds can have some space within the day to um, and build that trust between you and your report. Practice. So many, many, many of these conversations are incredibly uncomfortable. Like I just said, the art of the awkward one-on-one, -on -one, it's awkward for a reason. But all of this can get better with practice. Um, we're all going to make mistakes as we work towards this more just and more equitable world that we want. Um, I think for most people uh, who are underrepresented at work, we'd rather have our bosses try and screw it up than not try at all. There's a new article that just was released on LinkedIn, again, in the, in the links uh, from Megan Carpenter, where she says, get it wrong for me, for people of color, for women, for queer people, for Muslims, immigrants, for everybody. There is so much on the line. And if all if all that we are risking as bosses that we might make an awkward statement, I think we can do that. I think that's like an okay thing to offer. Um, it's also things, you know, I, I will use the they pronouns, which is singular they in English, which is awkward for a lot of people. So, you know, I've had friends who have just started practicing using they, not necessarily with me, with other people so that they could get better so that when they were talking about me, they didn't have to feel uncomfortable or awkward. So practice is a huge, huge help and it does get easier. Start thinking in terms of culture add instead of culture fit. Like I said earlier, tech is obsessed with culture fit. Uh, you know, you can look at these tech websites. It's just everyone playing ping pong and drinking beer, which is cool if you like ping pong and beer, but a lot of us don't. If we really start to look at culture ad, that's when we start to see diverse teams over outperforming less diverse teams, right? The only way you can get that benefit of the diverse team is if everyone feels comfortable sharing their thoughts and opinions. I have heard a story from a woman who I know who's in marketing. She was the only mom on the team and the only woman on the team. And they were doing a photo shoot for diapers and everyone else in the room was running the photo shoot and did not really know how to use diapers correctly. And so there were like a lot of really uh, just sort of inaccurate representations of how to use diapers. And she didn't feel comfortable uh, calling them out and saying, that's actually not how this works. So, you know, it didn't actually matter that the team was a little bit diverse because they weren't listening to her and they weren't asking for her expertise. So make sure you have a really authentic understanding of what everyone on your team brings uh, whether it's their actual skill set for the job or just their general life experience. Everybody has so much to bring to the table. Educate yourself. Uh, you know, people say always start following new people on Twitter. That's a big one if you're already on Twitter. Watch movies. Like if your reports are recommending a movie or a book, go watch it, go read it. Um, start reading books by people who you don't normally read books by. This has been one of the biggest things for me. It feels so um, sort of internal, right? It's not like something I can say to my reports, hey, I read this book by so-and-so. But knowing, the, knowing what's in the book and having that expanded sense of empathy and knowledge is so powerful. This also applies to things like if you want to accommodate an employee at work, um, whether it's a prayer room or a mother's room, maybe try Googling first, right? You can always go do some research and then come back to your employee and verify it. Um, don't put the burden of educating you on your employees. Do a little bit yourself and they will be more than happy to uh, help meet you halfway. 
last and certainly not least, increase pay equity and transparency. So like I said earlier, we know we're getting paid less. If this is not true at your company, if you think actually that your company pays fairly, then I feel like you should be shouting that from the rooftop. That's a really amazing thing to be doing. If it's not true at your company, then you know take it to your HR team, take it to your executives, see what you can do. Maybe there are companies that can come in and audit pay inequality, that kind of thing. Uh, this also goes for benefits. If you see someone on your team who's not taking advantage of their benefits, maybe they're not taking as much time off. They're probably suffering from the burden of over overrepresentation and feeling like they need to do more work than they actually need to. So keep an eye out on how people are using benefits and ask HR to do better and pay more equitably. I'm running a little over, but I have a few more slides. Uh, so what I'm all around, what I'm trying to say is that your actions as a leader matter. The good news is you're a good person and you want to do the right thing. And I know that because you're here and you don't have to be, right? That means you really do care. And I really appreciate that. Many of us fall into these leadership and management positions, uh, especially in open source where I come from. It's like, hey, you raised your hand and guess what? Now you're the leader. <laughs> there's no training. There's no official process. And I know I definitely feel kind of under equipped sometimes, right? But the fact of the matter is I've been given this leadership possible uh, opportunity and it's mine to make the world a better place. And in tech, we talk a lot about how to scale and culture is how you scale human behavior, right? So make sure that you are setting the right example. If you look away when someone harasses a teammate, misgenders a teammate, uh, makes a racist joke, then your team will do the same. And if you look away when your team is, you know, microaggressing someone on the team, that will flourish. Those microaggressions will flourish. It doesn't matter if you don't want that power, right? Sorry. But if you're in a leadership position, you have that power. And to relinquish it is to just give it to someone else. So make sure you are uh, setting the right tone for your team and looking out for everyone because it will actually expand beyond you. It doesn't have to just be you. And just one last statement as a reminder, this is not about looking good or PR or quotas or checking a box. Uh, this is about people's lives. When I entered the tech industry, my life was forever improved. Uh, my salary tripled. I had better health care. I have better work. I get to travel the world now to give talks like this at conferences, which is an absolute dream. Uh, this will materially improve the lives of others. And I think that should be shared more fairly, more equitably around uh, all these communities that have suffered so long from systemic oppression. So with that, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Like I said, I know there's a lot going on and uh, I'm gonna put in my slide link here. So if anybody wants it, all right, sorry, I'm trying to figure this out. I have it. There it is. It's a bit.ly link. I have a whole list of every article and study that I cite here. I am on Sparkling Robots on the Twitter, so feel free to follow me there if you have any questions. And I see a question from Tanusha. Uh, yes, let me pull that up from my slides. Here we go. There's this, this resource link. So contact information. Let's see. This article is the one, get it wrong for me, wrong for me, what I need from allies. It's a really good article. Uh, thank you so much all for coming. I'm just looking through your comments. If there's any other questions, let me know. Marie says you don't present your whole self at work. That is a huge, huge thing. It's really hard to deal with. All right. Thank you so much. I'm glad you all appreciated the animal pictures and thank you for bringing your own wisdom and experience. I am certainly not alone in knowing this and I hope to see you around the conference.